So you should be all right to uh, come forward. Oh, it's so brilliant to have you here tonight for our annual dialogue. I'm Louise Davis. I am the director of Christians on the Left. So a warm welcome. Um, I'd just like to uh, say thank you to our speakers. We've got Hannah Rich, who is our vice chair, who will be chairing the meeting tonight. And we have Selena Stone and we have Morris Glassman, and it's brilliant to have them here tonight. You may have noticed that uh, we are missing one of our speakers, Andrew Brin. Uh, unfortunately, he had to go up north earlier today because his grandson's been taken into A&E. So, you know, if you could remember Andrew and his grandson, Lyle, and all the family in your thoughts and prayers, that would be greatly appreciated. So, uh, without further ado, Thanks, Lou. Um, and it's an absolute treat to be here chairing tonight. Um, I know for many of you and for me that the calendar every year. Um, we've had some fantastic speakers over the last few years. Um, and as Lou alluded to, the lineup for tonight's event has changed this week. Um, I think more times than a sugar babe. Um, some of you got that joke. Thank you for laughing. Um, but we are really delighted that we have two fantastic speakers um, completing the lineup looking at the topic of how we can um, seek reconciliation in a post-Brexit Britain. And when we were planning this event a few months ago, uh, back in December when we started to think about what, what tonight might look like, uh, we were aware that we didn't really know then what post-Brexit would look like, what Brexit might look like at all. Um, we didn't think that we would get to this date two, day, two weeks uh, before the 29th of March and still have next to no idea um, of what will happen. But, but there we go. Um, Conrad Adenauer, Christian, German Christian Democrat and founding father of the European Union, um, said this. He said, we all live under the same sky, but we don't all have the same horizon. Um, and it seems to me that that really is at the heart of a lot of what we're here to talk about tonight. We will all live under the same sky um, after March the 29th, whether, whatever happens on March the 29th, um, or indeed on whatever other date is currently being negotiated across the road that that might shift to. Um, but neither will our horizons suddenly be all the same, whatever happens. Um, and to seek reconciliation post-Brexit doesn't just look like um, incessantly describing to each other what our individual horizons look like. Um, we can do that, and we do need to, I think, do some serious listening to each other right across the country, um, but also beginning to think about what it means to live well under the same sky. Um, so I hope tonight in our, in our contributions from our two speakers and from your questions um, and hopefully your contributions as well, we'll get beyond our different uh, views of Brexit policy, our different... Um, I was going to say solutions to it, but if anyone in the room does have a solution, I think we probably do want to hear that. Um, but to start imagining what it might look like beyond the end of March, um, but more long term as well, what it would look like to, to reconcile this country under the same sky um, and to live in the same country and to live well, um, without forgetting that we do, we do have differences and we should recognise those, um, but we can still live together. We do have different horizons, uh, but we do have the same sky. Um, so to our two wonderful speakers tonight, we'll hear um, for, from 15, 10 to 15 minutes from each of them first, um, then we'll have a, a bit of a conversation, and then I'll hand over to you guys for some questions, um, and there'll be a mic going around for that. So on my right, we have uh, Selena Stone. Selena is a tutor and lecturer in political theology at St. Melitus College. She's currently undertaking PhD research um, at the University of Birmingham, focused on liberation and justice in Pentecostal theology and ministry. Um, and before she joined St. Melitus, Selena worked as a community organiser and programme coordinator at the Centre for Theology and Community in East London. Um, she's committed to both academic work and practice, um, and in that vein, she is also a trustee of Power the, Power the Fight, um, which is a charity which offers training, resources, and support to community organisations and faith groups seeking to bring about an end to, look to youth violence. Uh, and on my left, we have Lord Morris Glassman, who is an English uh, political theorist, academic, social commentator, and a Labour life peer. Um, Morris is a senior lecturer in political theory at London Metropolitan University and a director of its Faith and Citizenship programme. Um, he's well known to many of us as the founder of Blue Labour, a term I believe he coined in 2009, uh, promoting socially conservative ideas on specific social and international issues uh, within the Labour Party. Um, so I'll hand over now to Selena to start us off for, for about 10 or 15 minutes um, and then we'll pass it. Wax multi-LGBT, leaving you with many more questions than answers. 
um, the Rohingya Mumbais. But what I want to do really is provide a kind of theological framework to help us think about these questions of reconciliation and um, what a reconciled Britain is and what Christian theology helps us to think about when dealing with the question of reconciliation. Now, the question of reconciliation often gets a similar kind of response to when we talk about forgiveness, a sharp intake of breath, some nervousness, when we realise we can't, contrary to what we wanted to do, ignore that person or those people for the rest of our lives. And we actually have to risk further pain if we wanted to move forward. We may, if we're honest, prefer to create our preferred future with people who are exactly like us, with those who think the same way we do, desire the same things, and also in the same way that we desire them. That would for us be effective, save lots of frustration, and get us to a better future a lot quicker. But the reality is that we can't eradicate people who differ from us in opinions and perspectives, and neither should we, even if it was possible to, to do so. Historically, what people have tried to do is it's led to things like genocide, oppressive regimes, the things that we generally condemn sooner, if not later. But what about the less extreme ways in which we seek to create our own personal utopia? Silencing the opinions of those we don't agree with, name-calling, creating a circle of those who become an, a chamber of echoing our own views. These are some of the ways in which we like to create that space where we can reaffirm to ourselves that what we think is the right way of doing things. But reconciliation is the other option. It comes into play when we choose to recognise the other person as equal in dignity and to make room for their power, even when it means us giving up some of our own. It is an act of humility and an act of hospitality. The act of seeing ourselves as we really ought to, as one among others, not as the most important one in the room. This long and often painful process of reconciliation is about recognising that what may be effective and efficient, going along with those we approve of to the exclusion of others, is not what is often best in the long term, particularly when we have particular views of those we think deserve to be part of the conversation and those who we think do not. Reconciliation is a pursuit of a genuine peace forged through deep relationship building, including the pain and risk that that involves. So what then of theology? What does Christian theology have to offer to this question of reconciliation? Now this idea of reconciliation isn't purely Christian. There are many people of other faith groups and those of none who hold to this idea of bringing people back together. But what is it that Christian theology offers us today? Within the narratives of our biblical texts, we find allusions to the image of the world as it was in the beginning, as intended by God, and then a recognition of a falling away from that state, and ultimately an expectation for what the world can and should be. Right at the start in the Garden of Eden, it is paradise created by God, perfect and uncorrupted by sin. And the subsequent narrative then describes what we know as the fall, encapsulating various levels of brokenness of relationship and division, which corrupt this once perfect creation the loss of loving relationship between God and people, the breakdown in the relationship of trust and love between Adam and Eve, which is then marred by blame, shame, and unequal power, and the shift in the connection between human beings and the natural world. That means from then on, Adam has to work very hard to produce any kind of food from a ground that would offer up freely its bounty for the human family. These layers of disorder and breakdown become the foundation for all of the turmoil we then see throughout the biblical text. Stories of dysfunction and oppression, war and genocide, sexual violence, envy and rivalries, idolatry and revenge. It won't take too much of an imagination for us to think about how these things play out even today. Human nature, it seems, remains constant while everything else seems to change. In our own day and time, we might look to the ways in which our humanity today is undermined by the neglect of our spirituality and our connectedness to God. The worship of other beings, images, and material possessions, 
whether celebrities or our own status, new cars and houses. All of these forms of worship that we can see as being destructive to our inherent human nature, leaving us to grieve and to the loss of the oneness with God and with one another. We are wounded by divisions from one another and the conflict which arises as a result. Inequality is tolerated, abuses of power seen as inevitable, unfair treatment accepted as the status quo. While we are increasingly aware of the impact our actions have on the natural world, we are still a very long way from this being a priority for each of us as individuals, for communities and for nations. So the need for reconciliation is clear. We are a long way away from Eden. And yet the redemption arrives for us in the acknowledgement of our own powerlessness to save ourselves. Feeling overwhelmed by the task of reconciliation is natural and normal, and is even the right response. It's the recognition of our own limitations that allows us to know we have to look beyond ourselves to find a solution. In the Christian narrative, the hope for redemption and for reconciliation of all things is initiated by God and comes in the person of Christ and in the kingdom which he proclaims and embodies through his ministry. John the Baptist makes way for this ministry by declaring, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, get a new way of thinking, turn away from what you've been doing and the way you have been living because a new king is coming who is going to bring about a whole new way of being. The Christian theology of reconciliation is rooted in the person, life and ministry, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ who is this king proclaiming this kingdom. In the yes of the young Mary, who is his mother, the plan is agreed by which humanity will be reconciled to God and to one another. In his very being, divinity and humanity are reconciled. Not willing to remain aloof and cling to his position, he is willing to lay down his rights, to take on the form of humanity and to live among us. This is the uniqueness of our Christian faith. And Christ can be, un can be understood as making two fundamental demands. In the words of Leonardo Boff, the liberation theologian, Christ demands personal conversion and a, a restructuring of the human world. By conversion, he suggests changing one's mode of thinking and acting to suit God and therefore undergoing an interior revolution. By restructuring, he means liberation from legalism, from conventions without foundation, from authoritarianism and the forces and powers that subject people. In practice for Jesus this means that he refuses to acquiesce to social expectations. He resists intimidation when they threaten to kill him. He rejects religious conventions and associates with those seen as not good enough. Jesus pays a high price for standing alongside the marginalised, the least and the lost, choosing to be close to the forgotten rather than aligning himself with religious and political authorities. He resists the seduction of earthly powers and in this, in this resistance he pays with his life. But it's the resurrection that, it is in the resurrection that we find that God has a final say over the systems of this world and the supposed victories. While death may seem at the end, in the economy of God, it is in fact a path to new life. So how might all of this inspire us for the work of reconciliation in our current context? Firstly, this all has to be held together in understanding that reconciliation is the work of God among us. The ministry of reconciliation and peace that God draws us into is his mission, and we are aligning ourselves with his spirit's work. In the view of this creative God who we find in Genesis, who creates all things and holds all things together, this may be a time for us to consider what new thing we may be created to be. Rather than attempting to reconnect to a kind of Eden, which for us might be the illusion of a kind of unified Britain that existed before Brexit, how might we take this opportunity to ask ourselves, at this moment in history when so much seems to be up for grabs, what might we want to create? What new form might we take as we inhabit the world? 
what kind of education, healthcare, international relationships might we desire? What value should we be led by economically? In creating this shared future, the question also arises of, of how we might go about forming the relationships which would be the foundation for this process. Finding unity between different groups of people who have a range of different experiences and interests is by no means straightforward, as many of you will know. But we have to be mindful of the fact that too often unity becomes a code for conformity, of the minority, the poor, the disadvantaged being swept along with the agenda of the powerful and the majority. Unity can only be genuine if all people have the capacity to be who they are, to be heard and known as they are, and to participate according to their will. In discussing reconciliation, we often encourage relationship building, which is indeed valid and important, but must be done with a level of awareness of our own privilege in those relationships. In Howard Thurman's words, we must be wary of treating our neighbours as objects of missionary endeavour and enterprise without being at all willing to treat them either as brothers and sisters or as human beings. In the willingness of Christ to reconcile in himself God and humanity, we find a call to closeness and to forming deep relationships of openness and trust, categorised by a sharing of power. Secondly, as seen through our biblical narratives, it is truth that lights the path to reconciliation. Not the truth about others, which is often the easiest thing to do, but the truth about ourselves. Many of us will be familiar with the language of confession, the power of acknowledging our own shortcomings, which opens the door to repentance and therefore to transformation. We do not, in our political conversation, seem to have space for truth, for confession, or even for honesty. And that is not a slight to politicians, but to a culture that expects very much and, and an education which often is lacking. The path to reconciliation depends on the confession of truths, a willingness to see things as they are and to confess the place we have in upholding these ways of being. The easiest thing to do is to blame the current picture on others, but are there ways in which we tolerate these same divisions and the unreconciled nature of our public life? Through our action or our inaction, how have we allowed things to be the way they are? Thirdly, in Christ's reconciling work, we find the truth that we cannot live according to the values and strategies of the dominating system if we want to see the newness of life that we hope for. In being present among the forgotten, in resisting earthly power, and being willing to be the sacrifice, Christ demonstrates that the ministry of reconciliation and peace is the work of a different kind of kingdom and a different kind of power. It demands a stubborn determination not to give in to the narratives that pit people against one another and that boil justice down to a zero-sum game. It calls us to resist the status quo, to question that things really have to be this way. We do not need a false peace or simply an absence of conflict, but a true peace developed through wrestling, truth-telling and a willingness to change. In the words of Ekemeni Uwan, True reconciliation moves beyond apologies. It requires defrauded parties to be made whole. It is uncomfortable work and it costs a high price. The question of reconciliation is really a question of cost and comfort. How uncomfortable are we willing to be to bring about true reconciliation? And how much are we willing to pay? Uh, thanks, Selena. And um, just before Mauro speaks to us, a reminder, I probably should have said this at the start, but if you're tweeting um, about tonight, the hashtag is hashtag Tawny19. Um, so I should have said that at the start, but there you are. Um, Morris, would you like to follow that for us? Thank you. And, and really good evening. And thank you very much, and, and Louise, for the, uh, for the invitation. Um, also, um, Tawny, just uh, is, a, is a huge inspiration of mine, and I'm really honoured to be able to 
to speak in an event um, in his honour. And I'm going more deeply to also express my always my profound gratitude to the to Catholic Central Court and to the Christian tradition for the ethics, for the politics that I had. It, it was only through engagement with the encyclicals, particularly Raymond Bowen, Chen Tesla Sanus was, was huge, but Labora Mexi Chen is I think is my is my number one hit in that in that regard. Uh, because it's it's superb on on, on what you were uh, uh, Sabina uh, saying you know, about the form. It's a theology of the form. <coughs> Labour by your sweat shall you live. You know, it, it's an ethics of, of, of work, of labour, and those two meanings of labour, both the reproduction of the species in labour and work, which is full of pain and full of difficulty, but also full of the possibilities um, of, of redemption. So I'm very, I'm, I'm always honoured to be asked, and Louise, any time, you know, I might be the B-list substitute, but I don't mind. I'm, <laughs> I walk humbly in the world. And, uh, <laughs> And, I, and I'm really, um, really happy to, to be here. Um, and to say, just to begin with the reconciliation theme, you know, just as someone who really supports uh, Brexit, has campaigned for Brexit, sees in Brexit the, the possibilities of democratic renewal, of genuine building of solidarity, I go into it. I don't know if I'm ready for reconciliation yet. <laughs> um, there's at least another two weeks to go. That's one side of it. Um, and and in a reconciliation, you must also be stubborn in asserting who you are and, and build up that new relationship based on reciprocity. But also to say, you know, that there's certain Blue Labour sayings that I think are important to reiterate. There is no one more intolerant than those who preach toleration, that there is no one more, more exclusive than those who believe in inclusivity. And, and the contempt for Brexit voters. The idea that Brexit voters are either one of two things. They're either ignorant in a very brilliant new concept since the referendum. People are undereducated. You know, as an academic, I've got to tell you, I'm really encouraging my children not to go to university for this reason, is that you have a contempt for others, that there's an idea that the progressive, this idea, you know, it's, uh, it's a joke I've often made, but it's worth saying, it's the last thing you ever want to hear when you go to the doctor. It's progressive, <laughs> right? And, and, it assumes a, and it assumes a certain teleology, a teleology that is, I think, profoundly anti-Christian, in that it believes that ultimately our liberation is found outside of relationships, that it's found um, in a certain conception of freedom that is entirely um, self-centered. It denies the concept of the fall and a tragedy, that what is before us is scary, and that we have to have a politics of the common good that brings various people into um, relationship with each other. It actually believes that history is preordained um, in, 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 in some very liberal way. And these days it assumes something very, very powerful which is related to the European Union, which is this concept of globalization. That globalization is a fate and a, and a part of reality when, of course, it's structured. And, and the most important thing in, in both the Bola Mexicans and Chetes and Masanas, which I picked up, is, is that capitalism, it says, has a structure of sin in it. And it's really worth thinking um, because what I've found, and I'm much more moderate than I used to be in expressing it, but I'm with you, so I'll try to speak quite plainly. Um, is that in liberalism there is no sense of sin. I've never met, I've never come across it in my life that people say I acted wrongly, I acted badly. And that their concept of conversation is exactly as Sabina said in, in what you're articulating. I'll talk to you as long as you end up agreeing with me. You know, as, as a, not open at all to being changed um, by the conversation. And above all, the leadership of the poor is. A, a, a crucial and, and extremely holy and important thing. And that means not consultation, but, but a leadership of the poor. And one thing you've got to say that I found in the, in the referendum is that the people who were most attracted to Brexit were poor, and they, and they had no leadership. There was no 
leadership, the trade unions, the Labour Party leadership, the universities, the BBC, all the main dominant forces of society were, were completely in favour um, of Remain, and yet there was a stubbornness in this commitment. Essentially, that the, the um, what you call the place over the road, that the place over the road was essentially a better bet than the European Court of Justice when it came to politics, the democracy. And also in this idea of sort of progressive liberalism is, is a very profound commitment to the idea that we're not social beings. This is totally tawny. But tawny, the inspiration for me from tawny was this concept of incarnation, essentially, that we are as as Jesus was, and embedded and embodied. We are, we are people, we're corporate, we're corporeal, we're, um, um, that we're social beings who find meaning in our redemption um, through love, essentially. That's how, you, that's, that's how it's done. And what you have is, is you know, the remarkable, what is our legacy of the church? The legacy of the church is that there is a church in each parish that it's embodied and embedded in the body politic. It's just about the only thing left in some places. But the idea of, of, of liberalism is that there is no place. You just move. It's unmediated movement. You could almost call it the Lisbon Treaty. You know, that there's freedom of labor, there's freedom of capital, there's freedom of good, and it is illegal to resist that movement. So there is an elimination um, of place, the assumption about the person is a starting point outside of place and all relationships. So that means it's it's ultimately liberal. And there's a conception of politics that is utterly loveless. It's justice based and it's procedural. So what you have confronting us is, I think, a really big structure of sin in relation to the to the EU is that it embodies all these things. The first is unmediated and unfettered capitalism that human beings and money and goods and services just move around without impediment. Um, in fact, I would argue strongly that it's illegal to resist capitalism under such a system, and it's certainly impossible to have a politics that upholds place. You mentioned Conrad Adenau, and I was very inspired by that early Christian democracy, and the early it's not the, you know, the what, do you remember, there's a certain of us of a certain age, do you remember when it was called the common market? That was a, yeah, God, those were the days. And, um, um, and before that, it was the coal, iron and steel union. And these were very different things. These was where protection of small farmers, worker representation in the corporate body, that was a really um, extremely important um, part of it. And a, and a general sense of a local subsidiarity. But if you look in the Lisbon Treaty about the definition of subsidiarity, it actually says it's the, it's the placing of responsibility at the highest level, not the lowest level. So we've entered a certain Orwellian world. And essentially, what the Christian origins of the, of the common market are indisputable, but it was lost. And it was lost as we lost it in Britain in the 80s, and definitely Hayek rather than Polanyi is the guiding, is the guiding force. And, it, and what Sabina said about human nature, it is, we are embodied beings capable of love and grace. We are also embodied beings capable of corruption and vice and how this world is, what it encourages and what it recognizes is vital, is vital to understand that. So, it's just to, to reiterate that we're living through a very peculiar time. You could almost call it an interregnum. Everything's up for grabs. Nothing, you know, everything solid melts into air. Everything holy is profaned. It's one of those periods. Um, the last one, I think, was in the 70s, which, remember, I'm a Spurs supporter, and so I can say with great clarity that our side lost in the 70s. And, and we can lose it again unless we can articulate what, what Sabina said, a genuine, compassionate and vision of a renewed nation and a, and a renewed democracy. So I'm just going to talk about that for a little bit, is that one of the things that I learned from, from studying Catholic social thought and then through 
my contact with my friend Luke Bretherton, he taught me a more charismatic or evangelical form um, of that, is real physical presence of being together with others in, in a place that, you know, this is not something you can do on the internet. I just slip in what I always say and say to my children every night, you know, the friends you've got on Facebook, they're not your friends. Right? So, <laughs> you know, you've got you to be, as they used to say in the 60s, with it. And you've got to be with, with people. And that's the concept of, of um, communion. And to share your fate with others is that you are elevated by those relationships. It seems to me that that's the crucial part of that relationship theology, that with others you are more powerful, with others you are stronger. And, and you, you, you live together in these ways. So um, I think that we've, what's happened is, is democracy is something that goes on far away, or because of the nature of the system, this globalized system that we have now, which is based on unmediated capitalism is one, a very constrained and loveless administrative politics is another. And the third is the elevation of a, a kind of liberal constitutionalism, which I think is a huge threat to faith, to love, and to the concept of place, all bound together by technological determinism. Now we've got the internet, so borders don't matter, boundaries don't matter, community doesn't matter. That's the relevance of the joke about Facebook is that we need to think about what would a form of Christian democracy look like in our country? We have to be bold and think like that and only what Christianity can really give. And so one of the things I'm saying to you is that there should be a new element in our democracy, which I call the parish commune, which should take place in every local area and it should be a direct form of democracy where people meet every three to four weeks, could be after church on a Sunday, but before the football, and, um, and people get together and they decide locally about education. Um, that's where really important conversations could go on about housing, about immigration, and you move up from the local as it should be in, in order to build um, solidarity. I was very inspired. I went to Syria to visit the Kurds of Syria who had fought against ISIS. I went there last April and um, last Easter. In fact, I, in fact, I visited the church in Baghdad on Easter Monday, and for that community there was no resurrection going on. It was a very important thing, but not entirely relevant today. But I went and the people who fought against ISIS in, in Syria had built a form, what they call democratic confederalism, a form of local democracy which is led by women. There has to be at least 40% women for it to be quora, and all committees have to have um, at least one female chair out of the two. I'm talking about Syria, this is going on. They're completely fearless, it's democratic, it's based on ecology, and that's the, that's the fundamental thing that I really want to say here, is that, is that ultimately the inspiration that comes to me from the Christian tradition that I will always honor and love deeply is, is about this. It's about the human beings of nature as a matter of truth Thing. We are not commodities, and the world that we live in is not to be treated as a commodity. This is creation. This is a divine um, gift. And early days, I mean, Hannah was saying about socially conservative um, and blue labour, it wasn't, it wasn't quite like that. Is that if you said something like, there is wisdom in faith, people in the Labour Party just thought you were some kind of fanatic, if you, if you said that love is found in family, people would say, don't, don't think so, and that was the, um, the, the best they could say, and obviously there was this huge reaction to this, and obviously it was about patriarchy and, and uh, child abuse, and, and above all it was a bit like the Remain Brexit thing, people who believed in God were just wrong, you know, they were making a, an epistemological error. And I always used to say the same thing, which was, yeah, but at least Christians don't think that the free market created the world. You know, that there is something anterior, something inherited through which you could resist the domination, and that's what it is. It's the domination of money, it's the domination of education that makes people feel stupid and delegitimizes them and makes them feel 
inferior. It's a delegitimation of feelings of love and loyalty. That what, this concept of social mobility, I measure it. I've got a new metric. How far you live from your mom. That's the measure of social mobility. That's their idea. It's just movement, movement. And this leads to the erosion of place, the erosion of, of democracy. So as you can tell, I could probably go on a while. So what I wanted to say was, it's, it's lovely to, to be here. It's important that we have this, this conversation from, from my side. Uh, I've been really spoken to extremely contemptuously and rudely in my life, but never before have I experienced what I've experienced since I've been involved with, with Brexit, including people doubting my sincerity. Oh, you're just doing it to show off, basically, was the nice side. But above all, a, a real lack of faith that we can live a common life and a common democratic life with our neighbours and get to know our neighbours and build a life um, with them. And I think that's the promise of, of what is happening, and, and I hope it's telos. So, really, thank you very much for having me. Um, thank you both so much for some um, fantastic contributions there. There's plenty of questions I would like to ask, but I'm, I'll try and keep it short so you can ask as many as possible. But I'll start with one which I think we haven't um, always heard a lot of in the, the Brexit conversation. So I'm interested to the, the pair of you coming from slightly different um, ideological positions on this. Where do you see the hope in all the conversations that we're having? I feel like um, a lot of the headlines we're having at the moment and a lot of the conversations around Brexit from both sides um, and from people looking at the, the chaos that is happening in our political climate at the moment, there's not a lot of hope being, um, being identified there. There's not a lot of hope being spoken about there. So I'm interested where um, both of you from, from your different angles see, see the hope at the moment. I don't know, Selena, do you want to start us with that one? I mean, I think there's hope in all the communities who are getting on with life, who are continuing to care for one another, continuing to visit their neighbours, continuing to care for the poor, continuing to look after for kids who don't have any food to eat, continuing to campaign on issues that matter to them. And I think there's something quite, um, what's unnerving sometimes is, that, is the feeling of people being swayed from pillar to post, depending on what gets decided in West, depending on what gets decided in Westminster. And there's something quite hopeful that, about people getting on with life and not allowing this to cause them to be paralyzed by fear or to basically give up all hope of anything coming out of this for the future. So I think my hope is really in that. I don't really think there's a whole lot of hope happening in the in newspapers. I stop reading them sometimes, they have a break. Um, so I would say that's where I'm looking. Great, I think. Thanks. Look, this is, you know, directly relates to us. So one of the dominant, as they say, in politics, one of the dominant narratives is that Brexit is a project of the right, and 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 so therefore, what the only vision is more capitalism, you know, Singapore, the Singapore of the North, and the inability of the of our movement, the labour movement, to articulate a a a vision of a new Jerusalem, a vision. Um, for, the, for the country. And so when it comes to the Remain side, what, what I think is, is that their only vision is more of the same, that it's just more endless. I, I sometimes call it an eternal Clinton presidency, you know, where, you know, nothing happens really except that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer and there's a whole load of programs go on, but the balance of power doesn't change. So the hope really, Hannah, lies in in a renewal or you know, Luke Betherton's book is called Resurrecting Democracy. That's where I think the hope lies in, in and in in creating, that's this idea of the parish commune, uh, a space where the where where poor people can actively participate in the governance of their lives and where you can make mistakes. This is the whole thing that I'm seeing is well, you can't allow the people to govern themselves because God. They're not very clever, low two two at best. You know, they they they're really not up to it. But what we're seeing at the moment, and be under no illusion, is the complete inadequacy of our ruling class. 
They are completely incapable of leading this. They, could, they don't want it. You can tell all the time that they're doing their best to, uh, to subvert it and their inadequacy. So what will be, what will, what will, what's, where I get my hope from is the incredible stubbornness of people in still hold, bearing in mind their lack of leadership in holding the views that they do that it's about democracy. I think we've got to articulate, that's one aspect that Sabina spoke of, which is hugely vital, is to make the distinction between globalization and internationalism, is to genuinely build reciprocal, equal relationships um, with people in the world and have solidarity um, with them. And trade unions and churches in China is a huge issue. We don't go anywhere near, but this is where we've got to, where there is tyranny, where there is oppression, and where there is exploitation, we must always build international solidarity. So for me, you know, the whole globalized EU system was hopeless. What we have now is the possibility of a bit of trouble, a bit of volatility. You know, this is what democracy is like. It's not, you know, here, this is where I would say a utopianism, be nice on Twitter, you know, but I don't go on Twitter at all because it's, it's sinful, it's just horrible. And, 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 and just build relationships with the people around you and do the politics and you'll be amazed how that, how that develops and, and particularly in our country to, to build broad-based coalitions between estranged interests that aren't talking to each other. So I don't see any hope without this, is what I'm saying. And, and, we, and it can go well or it can go badly, but what you must recognize is that suddenly politics is alive, that it, it matters. Um, and we're moving out of what I call Prozac politics to volatile politics, you know, real, real politics. So uh, get ready for that. Get, and and um, the only comfort I can give you is it won't be uglier than, won't, than what went before, but it will matter more. What happened, what's happening now, it, it kind of matters. And, and have the courage to, to make mistakes. You know, we're just so oppressed by this, by this system we have, so that's where I see the hope. Um, and you mentioned some of the, the volatility that we're perhaps living through at the moment, and um, depending on which way things go, perhaps going to continue to live through as Brexit gets worked out over the coming weeks, months, uh, God forbid, years. Um, but how can we live through that season in a way that is less divisive rather than more? So whether that results in a second referendum, um, personally, it's hard to see how that could, could become less rather than more divisive than the original campaign, whatever uh, ends up on the ballot paper. So how do you think we can live with this degree of volatility in our politics? Um, which I said that, that there is a massive division between middle and working class on this, that overwhelmingly, if you went to university and you got a degree, uh, particularly in the social sciences or in law, you're almost preternaturally disposed to be remain. It, I'll just, it, and, but people don't see it as a class issue, they see it as a matter of um, universal values. We've got to recognize how humiliated and abandoned communities in our country have been over the last 30 to 40 years uh, through globalization. So, so there's, um, there's, really, there's really intense class divisions. I think it's, it's very, very important, obviously, not to demonize, demonize the poor. I think that, you know, I can tell you for, for sure from the circles that I mix in that that the, if there is a second referendum, you know, the, the, the campaign of, 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 of uh, leave will be just one word, again, question mark. You know, what, you want to, you know, we got it, you want us to do the, you know, can you imagine if Remain had won? Do you think we'd be talking about a second referendum ever? And then they say it was, it was close, like, as, as if it's the remorseless. I was accused the other day of being an agent of Putin. You know, people have got all manner of, of bizarre ideas about this. So I would certainly say we shouldn't, we shouldn't do that, but 
you know, last time in, in 75 when there was a referendum, we were in the EU, it was 45 years until the next referendum. I think we should say that, that we'll have another referendum in 45 years' time. That's, that's OK. That gives us time to see if this works, you know. Um, but above all, what I'm, I'm addressing to you is, is your own leadership role, is, is, is to create a genuinely inclusive place where people can talk about this and articulate a democratic vision of our country that would be illegal under the present thing. And this is the curious place of Labour, is that more than 50% of Labour's economic manifesto commitments would, would be against the Lisbon Treaty. You know, you couldn't sell workers, you couldn't, the maximum, you know, we lived through this incredible thing, the financial crash. Do you, does anybody remember it? it, it, it right, so, According to the Office of National Statistics, 952 billion pounds were transferred from the public sector to the banks, right? Now, in my calculation, and I'm open to correction, that's the biggest transfer of wealth from poor to rich since the Norman Conquest. Okay, this is, this is a massive transfer. Um, now, the maximum you can spend on state aid without the permission of the commission um, for regional development is seven and a half million pounds. I mean, we should be thinking about a real redistribution of assets, a real redistribution, the banks of England, um, local banks, a vocational economy, renewing the idea of vocation, labor market entry, so that it's not just all about being good at A-levels, um, and, and a vision of the common good and a common life that we can now pursue. Um, so, the, so we've got to get away from saying to people, you got it wrong, let's try and make this, this work. But above all, it's got to be led by Labour. This is, this is my view. And that's the weird nature of the interregnum, because we do have a Prime Minister who's remain in the big Brexit party, which is the Conservative Party. And then we've got a leader in Labour who's Brexit, who's leading the big Remain party. So it's not a wonder. I think we've got to show some leadership on this, you know. Hello. Um, I think what we really could do, and I don't know by the way whether we're talking about the country as a whole or whether we're thinking about churches, but I think what we need to do is find something to do with the energy that's been created by this whole situation to put it towards things that are constructive. So, you know, families are arguing about politics who never really thought about it before. Friendships are kind of on the edge. Um, around because of Brexit and I think there's some really good energy that's been created that should be used for positive things. I think one of those things is doing the work of relationship building, like I talked about relationships a lot because I think so often the, the divisions that exist that are allowed to persist, persist because we just haven't ever got to know somebody and why they think the way they think. You know, I voted Remain, I have friends who voted to leave and actually sitting down and understanding where they're coming from has been super helpful to not be demonizing the other because of a difference in perspective. So I think that relationship building is key. And I think that's not just something that should be left until a crisis moment like this. That's something we should always be thinking about doing in our local communities and nationally is like, who are we actually getting to know and engaging with? I think that's important. And I also think political education is important as well. And now that people are asking questions about, you know, how does a bill get passed? Well, why are all these votes happening? Suddenly the kind of, the kind of mechanics of parliament are on front page news and people are asking about how government works. And I think that that is a huge opportunity to begin to unpick some of that stuff that people have just been happy to leave to the side. But suddenly in this moment, politics is really gonna affect people and it's creating the energy. So I think finding ways to use that well would be helpful to not let it kind of fester into that continuing discord and division. Brilliant. Um, there's so much more that I would like to ask, um, but I'll hand over to, to our audience for some questions and answers now. Um, I'll take them three at a time. Uh, and in the words of our former director, Andy Flanagan, please try and keep them to sentences rather than paragraphs uh, so that we can get through as many as possible. Um, and please, if you can, make sure that they end with a question mark. Um, would be a good rule. I'll take three from this side first and then move over to this side. So there's one over there. 
one at the front. Is there anyone more else on this side with really? it? And one over there. Uh, this is not directly for Lord Glassman, but I think in my community, my religious community, many people voted to leave because I belonged to a Greek speaking church and they'd seen the way the EU had treated Greece and they were hacked off about it. And I agree that lots of people are not on the right who voted for Brexit. But one of the things that we have seen, and I've just been uh, up in the north in uh, places like Sunderland and Middlesbrough, a real rise in the far right. And you talked about lack of leadership on the poor. How do we as a party, I belong to the cooperative party, um, how do we within the broad left actually develop leadership within our communities which actually can build that vision that you're talking about, that Pentecostal vision where we all share in that spirit? I went on a march with approximately 699,999 people. So you'll guess which side I'm on. I then went on to a Christian meeting. I had a placard, it was confiscated in case I should wave it. I had no intention of doing so, but they didn't want to take any chances. I then got on a train and the man on the opposite side of the train was so incensed by my placard that he wanted to argue. The conversation started at Waterloo, finished at Parkstone. Now his view was he'd been to see West Ham, they'd been beaten by Spurs, Spurs was my team, and what he said was, today you won, I lost. Over the referendum, I won, you lost. That's how it started, and it finished when we were talking more rationally, asking questions. Now, what I try to do is ask questions. And I went round literally to my neighbours, and I had my red rosette on, and I said, how do you feel about the referendum? And I got into so many conversations, virtually everybody wanted to talk, whichever way they were going to vote. And they said, we really don't have the information that we need to be able to know which way to go. That was the overwhelming thing. And frankly, I have been so worried before the referendum about the poison that was spoken about the EU. I thank God for the EU. And I tell you, if I could just start with one thing about it. Could you get to the question in a minute, please? Yes, let me say, at the beginning of the EU, the Iron and Steel community was founded at the inspiration of two Christians, Con, uh, Conrad Adenauer and Robert Schumann. They wanted to create a Europe where there'd be no war between nations, and it was created so that by putting the means of production, the coal and steel, in a common, uh, uh, beyond the individual states, that war would be impossible between them. And I'd like you to leave you, that's what inspires me with the EU. Um, and there's one more over that side. Um, yes, uh, same same question. Um, um, what I got um, from from uh, Lord Gasman's uh, point of view was uh, a very um, well spoken. Uh, we won, get over it. And I would like to know how how you actually see a reconciliation possible with uh, those people who voted for uh, remain and and create um, a common project for the common good. So um, I'll take them in order. I, I didn't catch your name, so forgive my rudeness. Okay, yeah, so I think that's, that's right. So the way, the way that I experience it, and I try to go out of London twice a week. I just, that's, that's the uh, vocational side and, 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 and hear what's going, what's going on, and what's going on is certainly a rumbling of betrayal. This is a, a that, and without a transformative vision from the left, that the energy will go to the right. That's exactly what's at stake here. Um, 
and what I'm saying to you is I completely supported the, I, I'll come back to this, it's not the direct answer to what you're saying, but there was a fundamental change in the, in the European Union, essentially around Maastricht, and then through to Lisbon, which intensified, and which meant that it was no longer about that um, cooperative work and, 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 and the building of, of genuine corporations based on the dignity of work and also the protection of agriculture, but it became essentially a big business um, project. So um, within the constraints, the democratic constraints laid down by um, Maastricht based on the primacy of the European Court of Justice, which is obliged to uphold the free movement of people, money, goods and services above all other things. And as you say, look at the effect that had um, in terms of Greece, um, but let's look at how things are going in Italy. Let's th look at how things are going in Poland. They can't do anything. So then it becomes a cultural right-wing resistance to that. So what's absolutely imperative is this building. And when it comes to leadership development, um, so I mean, I've always, you know, a leader is someone with followers. You know, try and the worst experience I ever had with was with Gordon Brown when I first started and I was invited, it never happened to me before, when Blue Labour was just beginning, invited me to, to number 10, and, and he sat down and I was rumbling about, there weren't many leaders from working class communities, immigrant communities, and he said, so what's your definition of leadership? And I just said what I'd learned, which is someone with followers, and the silence is still, <laughs> is, is still with me. So this idea of building up, you know, building up followers, it used to be the trade unions that, that did it. I mean, Ernest Bevin used to speak here. The the UN was founded in this building, and it was, uh, and it was founded by those people f um, fundamentally. So, you know that the so developing leaders who have followers in their communities is is the vital thing, and that doesn't mean leaders who then correct their communities and stand against them, but can build a broad based. Um, vision and then um and and this is what i say to you you know ask the people in um in ukraine and russia how how the eu is doing uh, right there and and let's look at what happened i mean when the kurds were bombed out of afrin the eu took the side of turkey this is what i'm saying is that something very bad has happened in in, in that story um and and that's what i say to you but and then in relation to what you said, I hope it isn't, we won't get over it because there's no, it looks like we might not win. You know, this is, this is up for grabs as, as, but the thing is, is to build a country that, and a politics that genuinely addresses the things that you love. So a, polit a, a democratic polity, a polity based on liberty, where there's freedom of, you know, we've got to, this is, the renewal of our civic inheritance, which has been decimated in quite a lot of ways. And, and that's something that I think that, that all of us can participate within. There's a, Tawny, Tawny's the best on this because he, you know, he tells the story of how very poor dispossessed people, which was essentially the English working class, built themselves a movement and an ideology where they had a respectable place, you know, the, and I particularly recommend his work on, on, on the enclosures, the, the fantastic work he did on, essentially people were just dispossessed by a free market and then they were confronted with a poor law state and their response was in, a miracle. They built a labor movement on democracy, freedom of religion and liberty. So it's the, it's the idea that you have to act, you have to participate and act. And that's the vision that I would hope would, would, would unite us all in, in that politics. Um, Selena, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on those as well. Yeah, so I think um, when it comes to leadership in any context, what we tend to do is find someone who, who we think looks like a leader and then try to convince lots of people to follow them. And I think when we're thinking about developing leadership, and this is in general, but particularly in terms of poor leadership or whatever we mean by poor leadership, but just kind of, there are people in these contexts, and this is my community organizing roots coming through, who are already very influential. 
um, who are already doing the work of encouraging other people, creating space for them, drawing them into community. And I think these are the people who we need to do the work of finding. And some of them are like grandmothers and, you know, you know, people who just work with their hands all day, gardeners, plumbers. They're not people who have necessarily gone to university, but we often think for some reason that we need to spend all of our time persuading people to follow those kinds of people. So I think we have to expand our imagination for what a leader looks like and create space for people wherever we are so bring people into our space. So I think when I was 14 and I was, you know, in youth group, somebody got me to preach in front of 400 people at 14 years old. And people think now I kind of sprung up out of the ground speaking, but actually somebody had to just take a chance on me when I was 14 um, and just support me and cultivate that in me. And I think when we're developing leaders, that's what we have to be looking for. Who's, who's already doing it, but just in the background and bringing them into that space where they can influence others. Thanks, I'll take three more questions um, from this side. So on the front, and then one at the back, uh, and then one on the second row back as well. Thank you. Um, I'm just thinking about when we talk about re reconciliation, you know what came to me, the two countries was South Africa and Northern Ireland, and how they dealt with reconciliation. And I know what's happening right now. It seems like we are going through the valleys of the shadows of death. But some people believe that we are already in the valleys of the shadows of death. So how then do we please or make everyone accept indeed the change that must come, the change that must happen? How do we allow hope to be participated and embraced? Okay, um, as someone who's sympathetic in many ways to aspects of Blue Labour's programme, um, isn't this obsession with Brexit and the EU as an edifice and a symbol for all sorts of other things, a distraction from the positive communitarian aspects of Blue Labour's programme? just as it's sort of sucking the life, su sucking the oxygen out of parliamentary politics at the moment. Um, I, I had the pleasure of watching Hamilton last week, which is a great musical about um, one of America's founding fathers, Alexander Hamilton. One of his big achievements was mutualizing the debt among the different states, so they had to rely on each other, and ultimately that led to independence from Britain, and uh, it also meant the North could hold the South to account on things like slavery. And the Lisbon Treaty and the EU are obviously different things from that, but isn't the principle of mutualizing our burdens and sharing that with other countries in order to, to be truly interdependent and therefore forced to work together and united and achieve things together, isn't that something that as Christians on the left, isn't that something that we should support? And perhaps the EU's not I'm not pretending to use the perfect institution, um, but isn't there something good about that, about being interdependent and mutualizing? Selena, do you want to start us off? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Oh, okay. No worries. Sorry. So how do we allow hope to be embraced? Um, I think we have to tell hopeful stories and change the narrative because it's not, there's really good things happening all the time, every single day, that we just never hear about them. And we can feel as if our country is kind of slipping down a sinkhole if we kind of keep watching the news. So I think we need to tell stories wherever we find them, at whatever level we are, whether we're in a local community, whether we have a national role, wherever we find ourselves, I think we model that. I don't think hope just springs out of the air automatically. I think it has to be cultivated in the way that we are, in the way that we speak to others. So that would be my thing on hope. Um, I would agree that there's something very Christian about interdependence and something very Christian about um, engaging with others through both good and difficult times. A, a almost covenantal relationship, I think, is a very Christian idea. And I think that's important. Um, and I'll leave my comment there, because I'm sure you have lots to say on this. I wonder. Yeah, so I'll reiterate 
but it, but in terms of, of, of your question, it, it is, you know, the, the hope comes when you, you see things anew, the old things, and you see them um, anew. And it, it's, it's got to be that we look at each other in different ways. And, and the, key, the key values here are reciprocity, mutuality, solidarity. The incentive structure of our whole society is based on, as I say, the, the individual above all other career, above vocation so you know that's the journey in terms of the question the, so in terms of sort of my work with with this is what i saw with increasing concern and this this relates to what you said about the rise of the right what what i what i couldn't see in labor was any real articulation of working class support for brexit that there wasn't any representation of that voice i was surrounded you know, I call the House of Lords the Kingdom of Romania. You know, it, it, it's, it's just like that. I, I, I walk into work, and essentially during the referendum campaign, that's what I was saying about, you know, people go happy with the company you keep. You know, this was, it was a very sneery and snobbish um, um, attitude. And, and I'm, I'm looking for you. So what I thought was vital um, at that time, and we would have to make you know, our calling, how do you act? You know, I thought it was just absolutely vital that this politi that, that I, or, and Blue Labour as a whole, just to let you know, had many different views on Brexit. There were people who were remain, and we had those debates very publicly so that people could participate in them. But I just saw it as, as my responsibility to, to articulate a view that was not being expressed in the in the political sphere and if it had been expressed um i i, I wouldn't have i'm really looking forward to this period of time being over but as you say it might never end um so that's something and, and then you know hamilton was a very ambiguous figure um i think I indeed and, and one of the things he did was it wasn't a mutual dependency through the construction of the bank. It was actually the creation of the, of the first American central bank, which, which led to a certain pathway of American capitalism that we can see working out now in, in all its horror, you know, a dispossession of, of so many people. And that's the story uh, I feel that people have lived through. They lived through a dispossession. And when, when you say, Sabina, about covenantal thinking, this is exactly what's... And what people thought was, well, I don't have any money, I don't have any job prospects, but there is something out there that there's parliament, there's, there's a civic inheritance, and this is also being dispossessed. You know, d bear in mind that it's a very different tradition in, on the continent of Europe, which is essentially based on directives and statute law, which is quite different. And so in our arrogance, we think, well, if you elect things, you can change things, but that's not the way it works in constitutions and constitutional forms. You can't change anything, which I think is why the, yeah, so it's going, as I say, just have a look at Poland, have a look at Hungary, have a look at Italy, have a look at Greece, and have a look at their relationship with the European Central Bank and fiscal policy. There's a story there that people will tell you, and it's a story of powerlessness and dispossession. That's the story that's being articulated, uh, and, and it's the same here, and this is the roots of this insurgent right. So it's vital that we construct and tell a story which gives people some power. I mean, that's the other thing with organizing, is the ability to act. You know, that's the... And that's why I say about making mistakes, in a way it doesn't matter if it's right or wrong, the important thing is to get the thing moving. And then you learn and you reflect together and you get to, to, to better places. So I would say that, that you know, ha it, what has happened in Europe is not the mutual sharing of fiscal responsibility, it's the absolute domination of the big economies over the small. You know, that this, this is what's happened here and there's no accountability in the framework of the European Central Bank. It's entirely um, based on, on procedural forms. So what we do need in our country, I just, you know, as you said, I've got a lot to say about this. If you look at the data, the centralization and concentration of ownership in the city of London. Do you remember a time when we had things like the Halifax 
and the Leeds Building Societies and the Northern Counties Building Society, Northern Rock, all of them gone. All of them are now owned by the same oligopolies. There's no assets left. It's been sucked in. So one of the things I definitely think we should do is, which would be completely against EU law, is if, if the bailout was 952 million, how about 10%, 95 billion to endow assets, local banks in local areas, where people could have choice to usury, to, to payday lenders on the one hand, businesses can have access to capital on the other, because there's been this dispossession over time, and if we can't restore, have a covenantal restoration, and I, th and I just want to say to me that there's a lot of really rich ways of thinking in a covenantal way rather than a contractual way. Uh, and I think that's part of our responsibility, however difficult that is to articulate. Great. I'll take another round of questions. There's uh, one at the back, one down the front here, and uh, one in the middle there. We'll have time for at least one more round after this. Um, and I've been asked if you could say your name at the start of your question. Um, and again, to put a question mark at the end, please. Um, my name is Joan Grant. Um, I, I sympathise with um, the view of Lord Glassman. Indeed, I voted to leave, but it seems obvious to me that Brexit is actually a sort of right-wing kind of disaster capitalism. And I think that it's, it's basically naive to think it's going to be anything else. So, um, And also, I know you want to question, but... Um, this whole business that the EU is going to stop us renationalising and all of that sort of stuff, that's all nonsense because all of the other companies, countries totally ignore the state aid rules. They just do what they want. So the, high, the idea that we would be stopped because of um, being in the EU is rubbish. So the question, I suppose, is, having got ourselves into this dark place, how do we get out of it? Because it's, you know, Brexit needs to be stopped because it is just a it is disaster capitalism. Hi, I'm Andy. Um, I would like to take us away from Brexit, and I wonder if either of you would like to comment on um, some Guardian columnists who have been getting quite excited about the Preston model. Um, so Preston Council have been um, uh, giving favourable conditions for local procurement, so all the um, uh, departments are buying locally, and it seems to be having a brilliant multiplier, multiplier effect on the local community. They're also setting up a massive cooperative uh, sector there and a local bank uh, that's going to stretch across the northwest. Um, and I wonder if we're, if uh, Morris is talking about um, local solutions, if that might be a model that other areas uh, might look to follow. Hi, I'm Stephen Beer. Um, I voted Remain and I've spoken at uh, events like this in the past on the theme of reconciliation. And uh, I've often found as uh, a person who voted Remain, I've been trying to seek ways that, uh, and in dialogue, that we can bring the country together. That's why I'm a member of the Christians on the left, of course. I found in those events that um, the Brexiteer speakers tend to basically accuse me of being patronising for having voted Remain and tell me how good uh, and wonderful Brexit will be, or their own particular utopian vision of Brexit will be. And I kind of feel that's kind of where we are uh, this evening. I just wanted that the speakers could reflect a little bit on two aspects of their theme, this theme of reconciliation. First, uh, how actually, you know, what concrete steps can be taken, not just to um, re you know, repeat our own visions of what we would like society to be, uh, whether it's communes in different uh, villages or, or you know, uh, you know, greater openness in markets, whatever we think it should be. How can we actually um, shake hands with those people who, do, who have different views to us uh, and, and politically build a kind of future that we as Christian socialists here are thinking about? Secondly, we, you know, it's a, cha a chaotic situation over the road at the moment with the government, if I've got it right, so I'm like voting for, a, voting for a no deal and being defeated on that. Uh, we're in a very odd situation. We might, who knows, have a second referendum. If we do, how can we fight that referendum in a spirit of reconciliation uh, and constructive debate that respects the other and seeks to understand each other. How can we do those two things? Uh, Morris, I wonder if you'd like to start us off with uh, maybe just a few of the many things I'm sure you have to say in response to those three questions. Yeah. Um, the, 
the first one is is just to enter into a, a civic dispute about um, so if if you look at it um, it's it's once a company's been privatized then it's very very difficult to renationalize that's the, that's just the data so the only you know two two companies that have been nationalized can only in Britain in the last 30 years are Northern Rock and the Royal Bank of Scotland and it and you have to privatize them so that's just a kind of technical issue and I, I do think that we should be a country that seeks to uphold the law and not to cheat I think that's a very important principle that is a bedrock um, of of where we are in, in terms of in, in terms of of, of what you're saying I th see for me the re reconciliation is fundamentally um, the best way of doing it is to is to live a democratic life with the people around you you know that's the that's that's the way ahead so referendums in their nature are very divisive that I mean because well we thought when we had the referendum that there was a winner and a loser that's one of the reasons why you may hear people from the Brexit side we're constantly being told that we that there was something wrong with that result um, so that I'm just trying to explain why that would but this does give us an, an opportunity to fulfill your politics a, a, a common good a democratic vision a, a country um, which where, where there's some dignity restored to labor you know it's this remorseless contracting out of, of things and life that's what you could do with London citizens was the cooks, the cleaners, and the security guards who never got invited to the Christmas party. You know, they were just external. So we've got to rebuild, you know, the corporate body, the body, the body politic. This is, this is, but only where there's a way is there a will. So my concern is with our trying to develop and articulate um, that way um, that is fundamentally inspired by the Christian socialist tradition. The bad news is it's not very strong in the academic world, I can tell you, but the good news is it's very strong in the hearts of the people of the country and I see that everywhere I go. So it, it's, a, it's about that leap of faith in people and redistributing power to them in the knowledge that we are fallible, dependent beings who can make mistakes. So the rule is that you do it again and again, but I do think that there is a, a space there. Great, and Selena? I think I would just say that I think any attempt to kind of pre-decide what steps should be taken to accomplish anything with others is already failing to do what it needs to do because the steps have to be decided together of what's necessary. Um, and I don't know how in where, whatever context we're in, we find ways to gather around tables with people and, and wrestle with these questions and figure them out together. But I don't think we can predetermine with people like us what's necessary. And I think that's what the question is getting at. How do we not just repeat our own vision of what needs to happen, but actually do that in, com in collaboration with people who have different perspectives? I think it's a long process, but it's ha it just has to be done. There isn't another way of kind of getting it to be done by someone else. Or you have to make the time to sit down and gather together and figure out what's going to happen. Great. And we're going to have, I think, time for one more round of questions. Um, so one at the back, nice and easy. Um, one there in the middle, um, and one final one over here. And there'll be plenty of time to continue these conversations um, afterwards with another cup of tea and things. So um, yeah, we'll start over there. Gillian Troughton um, from Cumbria. And I was interested in what you were saying at the beginning in your uh, opener, Morris, about um, people thinking they're stupid and people being led to um, believe that they're stupid in the political processes, particularly when it came to the referendum and post the Brexit vote. And actually, I think that's because we explicitly told them that they were stupid. And that was both sides of the argument. And, and particularly since the vote, there's been lots of name calling. And I think that's part of a bigger picture of how society at large and, and politics in particular has become. Um, that it doesn't matter how much we agree on things, but as soon as I say I support Manchester United, the rest of you will go, I'm not voting for you, because that's what it's become, one little 
niche thing is sending us off and we've become very, oh, well, I don't agree with you on your bourbon biscuits, so I can't possibly agree with you on anything else. So I had a, a conversation earlier, and I just want to test this hypothesis with someone who said, um, uh, are you do, are you with the Labour Party? Is, the, is Christians on the left affiliated to the Labour Party? And I said, yes. And they said, well, that's a shame. And I said, why? And they said, oh. And I said, well, I think it's, you know, it's a socialist party and we believe in all these values and we need to fight for what we believe and to be a coherent whole, um, making sure that we can have equality but I think I used the wrong word, and I think we often all do. I think we should be using a very Christian word of love. And I'd like to know what the panel think about that, that we should be substituting fight for love. Because we often go into that fight, you know, in the ring, ding, ding thing, which puts us in opposition rather than what you were saying about coming together and, and discussing and seeing where we agree and compromise and then forming a proper opinion. And so often, because it's round, spells out round one, we don't do that. We're immediately in opposition, so we never listen. Uh, just make them quick. Yeah, um, just your opinions on constitutional political reform because to me this is necessarily totally necessary political and constitutional reform in the future post brexit hi matt bundy uh Southampton uh, one of the main reasons we can all say we got involved in politics is x for me it, it was young people and i think a big part of that was about the way that there was this big, big feeling after the referendum that they were just outvoted and a lot of people were saying, listen, we, you know, we, we really want to stay. So I think any reconciliation goes forward, no matter what side you're on about, needs to think about um, making sure the young people do feel looked after. So I think the question to the panel is just how we make sure that we do that, because I think to a lot of them, I think in some parts of the country we're seeing young people take to the ballot boxes and youth quakes, but other parts we're seeing people who don't want to know, because the only time in their life they've ever voted, they were outvoted, and now they've got to leave the EU. So I just think any reconciliation is challenging without that, and I'd just be interested to hear what the panel thinks about that and how we can really tie in on young people and get them involved again, because I do think there is a really big risk. Thank you. Thank you. My name's Fred. Um, I'd just like to ask, um, based on what has been said about uh, the, the class and, and um, economic uh, reasons for, for voting leave, why is this happening here and nowhere else? Selena, do you want to start us perhaps with the question about young people and then uh, broad run out from that? So I would say, um, I think when engaging with young people, it's helping them to prepare for the long haul. So helping them to understand that politics isn't always going to be getting what you want, but actually the long haul is worth it. So preparing them for that, like the disappointment and coming back again and allowing them to understand that's what politics is about, continuation and perseverance. Um, in terms of the love versus fight question, I would say, I would be happy to drop the fight language, but I think love sounds too fluffy. I know as a theologian, I'm supposed to say yes to love. Um, and I do believe in love, but I think when we're thinking about public life and interests, I think love becomes this thing that is like candy floss that doesn't really have much substance. You kind of have a little bit of it and it doesn't really do much for you. And I think we'd have to have something a bit more concrete, but I do think we have to have a language about our engagement that brings in something of our Christian narrative. And maybe the covenantal stuff's part of that. Because in a way, you, you fight for a covenant, not with violence, but to sustain it. You persevere to maintain a covenantal relationship. It's loving, it's important. It's not easily thrown away, um, but it's not something that's aggressive either. Brilliant, thanks. So I'll try it. So first of all, just you know, bringing words of of hope this is just my experience is that if i if i speak so m the big distinction i make in politics is between people who think covenantally and contractually contractually is just a mutually advantageous time-bound thing but 
but covenant is about redeeming a promise you know and and it involves a completely different because losing is part of that story you know it's a long it's a long story this is what i'm constantly thinking about with this debate is we're thinking about oh it's going to be a, some economic difficulty now and but over time and this is also a response to to the right it can only work in our favor because it will restore democratic sovereignty which means that you can act in ways that you can't act um without it whenever i talked i talked to the erg and the people on and i always say why are you doing this for socialism why the eu is perfectly hospitable to your capitalist desires why are you doing this and it, it's a strangely confused answer um i get but to just just say to you that i find that, that if you use words like inclusivity accessibility no one listens to a word but if you talk about redeeming a promise if you talk about working together in a meaningful in a meaningful way um the inheritance of the christian language we haven't lost it and what i'm saying is it still resonates so you don't have to use the the language of boxing but there is a battle between good and evil there is a in all in all of us so i'm not saying that the you know the temptation and the, and and corruption are are manifest and and all i'm sharing with you is is that people still talk and live that way with that language so it's much more not to use a technocratic language and and to explore explore that um the second one about the constitution i'll just be very quick but i've got a real love of the ancient constitution this idea of the balance of interests rather than the separation of of powers um th the way the way that it conceptualized the body politic is very important so i, I would look for a, a renewal within that and, and then when it comes to, to young people, obviously, you know, I came into politics um, for old people who I felt were being really despised and rejected and euthanasiaized and, you know, everything was about young people. And I see that as a real key part of sort of authoritarian regimes, you know, is the Juventus was a Mussolini thing, you know, the young, the glorification of the young. And what I saw was a marginalization of, of old people. So in the politics that I wish to see, what's vital is that there is a relationship between old and young that is absolutely pursued because I find that, I find this, this idea that it's all about young people kind of a bit scary. Um, young people obviously are immature, you know, that's the nature of being young, that there needs to be some growing up going on. And what we have, I think, is an entirely immature politics you know that's that's one of the things i'd say and then why did it happen fred your thing wh why here well I, th I think because alone this is my view um in in the 20s and the 30s europe went fascist or communist there was a terrible every one of those countries has had a terrible experience of a disruption and of a really ugly authoritarian politics whichever side it was on and in many ways the eu has certainly tried to present itself as the alternative to like basically constrain democracy and you won't get the volatility but that wasn't our experience so i think there was there was a sense that something was being lost in the story and i think it's a particularity of our of our country that there was a resistance to that that's that's what i think is distinctive um about what happened so i, I take a kind of historical view of that and one final question for me we've heard um a lot of very high level conversations a lot of fascinating insights on on brexit tonight um but what one thing do you do you both think we can do um as people in this room many of us are labor party members some of us are not many of us are members of churches but we're all um individuals so what can we what one thing can we uh do to advance this conversation to um to hopefully start in one very small step building reconciliation both both now and post brexit i would say to make some space in your diary for a dinner conversation a coffee with a person or people in your local vicinity who you don't agree with 
and have a deep and meaningful conversation where you are yourselves, you say what you really think, and at the end of it, make sure both of you are still alive and you've shaken hands. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, that's a challenge for me, I'm sure, for the rest of the room as well. Um, Maurice, what one thing can we, can we do as a result of tonight to, to start building reconciliation? Yeah, I, I'll agree, but as opposed to the dinner, the one-to-one, -one, really sit down with a person that you really disagree with and open your heart. You know, this, this is the crucial thing about the relational thing. Be prepared to change. And, and so just to say that that's the discipline, I really try and find the connection and it likely is it won't be on this issue but it will but but this is the thing to retrieve a, a sense of the holy in the in another person is the entire objective of this in a world both national and global where there is sustained inhumanity where we're just a thing a commodity or a thing so I, I completely, Sabina, agree. But make it a, make it a one to one, and forty minutes will do the job. I think you know, you'll know then. I think we'll leave it there. Thank you both for a, a fascinating conversation. I think yeah, a round of applause would be very much um, in order. And thank you, and thank you all for. Um, and thank you all for some really great questions as well. Um, I'm going to hand back over to Louise Davis, our director, um, to close us now.